Let's pray. Jesus, as we open your word, we'd like to be drawn into your presence. We simply ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We spent the last three weeks talking about the basics of salvation. How to receive salvation, what it is, how it works, grace. Got a question for you. Is it easier to get married or stay married? Which is easier? Getting married or staying married? Which is harder? Which is easier, buying a piano or learning to play it? Learning to play it's much harder than buying it. Which is easier? Getting a puppy or raising the puppy? Uh, raising the puppy is much harder than getting the puppy. Right? And I've, well, which is, which, is, which is harder? Let's put it that way. Um, enrolling in university or completing the coursework? <laughs> completing the coursework is much harder. And what about living the Christian life? Which is harder? Coming to Jesus in the first place or walking with him day by day for the rest of your life? I'm not asking for ha hands here, but I know me, I can wander in a moment. And I've known people who've come to Jesus, had a powerful experience with him, and then just it's just faded away, kind of like an old marriage. It's gone, drawn, gone cold. So today I want to talk, I, I've entitled the sermon just to get your attention, um, How to Survive Getting Saved. We want to not only receive salvation, but we want to make it through to the end, Right? And sometimes we have the idea, well, then that means I need to try harder to be good. Well, what do I do? Is there any doing? Is it all him? Is it part of me? What is it? So let's review what we've learned and pick up on that subject. My favorite verse to preach on, this is the testimony that God has given us. It's a gift, eternal life. And this life, this eternal life is in his son. He who has a son has life. He who doesn't have the son does not have life. We noted that eternal life comes packaged in a person. Not a church, not a lifestyle, not a doctrinal belief, not overcoming all your sins. It comes packaged in a person, which means you have Jesus, you have a person by relationship. Salvation is about a relationship, not about behavior. We noted the verse 13, written this to you who believe, believe, trust. Those are relational words. Uh, if we are trusting in Jesus, that's a relationship. We have eternal life. We uh, noted that God has a gift for us. We put three verses together. Uh, 1 John 5, 11 to 13, and then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Um, Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life. We notice God has a gift for you. It's called grace or eternal life. It comes through trusting in Jesus, the Son of God, and you can know you have it. We also discovered that uh, a gift has to be how free to be a gift. It's not a wage that you earn. It's not somebody makes a huge down payment and you have to do the monthly installments. It's not a bargain where you get a whole lot for a little. It has to be completely free to us. Cost somebody else the whole thing, but it's got to be free to us. God is a gift for us called eternal life. We notice that there is a wage we can earn, and that wage is death, and that comes through sin. How many of us have earned the wage of sin? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all down the river. We're all in need of a solution. What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. And we likened it to a couple of illustrations, a stop sign. How often are you supposed to stop? Every time, how much of a stop? All the way. You can't stop at 99% of stop signs and be a law keeper. You can't stop 99% of the way and be a law keeper. It's all or nothing. And we notice if you run the stop sign, they haul you into court and they impose a fine, $300. But if you're up in a tall building like these guys having lunch on a skyscraper under construction 100 years ago, if you fall off that beam, does anybody have to impose a penalty on you? No, because there the penalty will be intrinsic. It just is a natural result. Now, going over to God's laws, 
I believe, as we've seen here, law demands perfect obedience and a penalty even if you're sorry. God's laws are simply the laws of life. They describe how life works. I don't think God made up some stuff to get us to try to hard to obey. He simply says, this is how life works. And if you step outside of how life works, what do you step into? How life doesn't work, which is called death, okay? Now, is that penalty of sin intrinsic or imposed? And that was our major point a couple weeks ago. A lot of us have been raised on the idea that God is going to punish sinners. Which means, if you sin, God's going to kill you. A little sin, big sin, he's going to punish you, and he only has one punishment. Kind of like my grandma. I had a grandma, my dad's mom. She only knew one punishment, and that was getting a switch off the tree and having you pull your pants down and getting it on the bare butt. I got to where I didn't really like to go visit grandma because every infraction was the same penalty. Little big. And God says, you sin, you're going to die. And an imposed model says, you sin, God's going to inflict, impose the penalty of death. But the intrinsic model, and I believe the Bible backs up the intrinsic model, says sin carries its own wage. Sin carries its own results. When you sin, it's moving outside the laws of life. And when you step outside the laws of life, life doesn't work. That's death. So we noted that we need to go with an intrinsic model. God's not killing sinners. Sin's killing us. God doesn't say, serve me or I'll punish you with death. He says, you're dying, serve me and live. Jesus didn't come to save us from what God's going to do to us because we sinned. Jesus is God come to save us from what sin is doing. God's in the rescue business. He's not in the condemnation business. The condemnation is intrinsic. God comes to save us from that. So we noted then that there's bad news in the Bible. We've all sinned and the results are death. We're all doomed. It's lethal. The good news, God has made a way for us to move from death back into life, and that's called grace. We liken grace to a bus. You don't drive the bus, you didn't make the bus, build the bus, maintain the bus, decide where the bus is going, and the bus does what the bus is going to do whether you get on board or not. You could die and the bus is going to keep working. The bus is totally separate from you. The only thing you have to do with the bus is decide if you want to get on the bus. And if you get on the bus, you can't help but end up where the bus is going. And the bus God has built, it's all him, is called grace. So last week we tried to figure out how grace worked. We put a timeline up and we asked the question, from the moment that we accept Christ, at that point, what happens to our past? What happens to our future? We noted our past is full of sin. The Bible says, if you confess, he's faithful, guarantees. If you confess, plead guilty, he's faithful, guarantees. And he's just, he has the legal right to forgive your sins. We don't have to repeat the past. We're, the past no longer condemns us, and we're not condemned to repeat the past. That's good news. But what if I do sin? The verse goes on, if anyone might sin. And what are the chances you might think at least one bad thought between now and eternity? Pretty high, right? Okay, so what if I do? We have an advocate, literally one who's on my side, Paracletos, the one called to stand beside me. He's up there with the Father, and he is Jesus Christ, and he's the righteous one. That word righteous is built on the same root as just in 1 John 1, 9. The one who has the credentials, having paid my penalty to cover my past, has the credentials to guarantee my future. Now under that, I can know I'm saved. Right? It's all covered in him. So we ask the question, how does he cover my future? We understand through his death penalty paid, he covers my past. How does he cover my future? Romans 5.10, if when we were enemies... If when we were enemies, that's past tense, enemies, what made us enemies of God? Sin. And by the way, we're enemies towards God. He is not enemy towards us. All the en enemying is going one way, right? The tomatoes are all being thrown one way. God is trying to love us and bring us home, and we're telling him to go away and leave us alone. All the enmity is from us to him. When we were enemies, not when he was an enemy, when we were enemies, we were reconciled, reconciled literally, brought back together through the death of the Son. Well, how, what did his death do? His death took my sins, nailed them to the cross. That means there's no sin between me and Jesus anymore. Amen? In fact, I, want to, I believe that there's not a single sin between any human being and God today. 
because Jesus foreknew them all and they were nailed to the cross. All sin has been handled, amen? The only thing between anybody and God is Satan's been lying to them that they don't want him, it's not going to be good, all sorts of lies going on. Jesus forgave our sins whether we wanted him to or not. Now he's trying to talk us into accepting the reality, accept the benefits. So we were reconciled, brought back together with God because our sins were taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. That's good news. Now, much more, even better news than that. You mean there's better news than total forgiveness? Yes. Having been reconciled, we have to go for forgiveness first, but once that's in the bank, we shall be saved. We're going to make it. The Bible says we are going to make it. Amen? And what guarantees that we're going to make it? We shall be saved by his life. Jesus' life is what covers my future. If he, all he had to do was die for our sins, he could have come down on a Friday, gone back on a Sunday and made a weekend out of it. But instead he came and lived a full life first, three decades worth. Why? Because law demands more than just penalty paid. Law also demands a perfect life. And Jesus came and gave the perfect life I don't have to give. Then he died the death for all sin so that both demands of the laws are covered. Jesus' life fulfills obedience that I don't have to give. I don't have a perfect life. He does. His death takes care of all sin so that when I come into Jesus, the one who has the Son has life. I don't get Jesus' credit card that I can slide every time I make a mistake and he pays the bill. He doesn't give me. But faith involves our responses. I'm involved with faith. So let's talk about faith in light of the diagram. Faith. There are a couple of levels of faith. There's intellectual faith. Uh, there's... I believe in the bus, there comes the bus. Yep, I believe in the bus, there goes the bus, right? That faith didn't get you anywhere at all, but you believed in the bus, okay? It's got to be more, so we're going to call it saving faith. Saving faith, I believe in the bus, I'm getting on the bus, and I'm going with where the bus is going, all right? Saving faith, real faith. Two synonyms for faith. What are two synonyms for faith? I heard trust, that's the second one. What's the first one? Belief, okay. Belief and faith. Now, I want to... Define these, I want to define belief as intellectual and I want to find trust as commitment. They are synonyms, but you know, even synonyms kind of lean a little bit one way in their meaning or lean a little bit another way. So we're going to lean belief over to intellectual and we're going to lean trust over to commitment. And I want to illustrate that with this chair. Let's just say for the sake of illustration that this is your living room and you have a lot of friends over today. And I show up at your house for the very first time. I've never been here before. And you point at a chair and you say, Pastor Gary, have a seat. Well, that's kind of you. That's good, good uh, hospitality. All right. Now, have you ever sat down in a chair that didn't hold you up? I have. It can be embarrassing and it can be injurious, right? It can be painful. Now, you probably don't draw it out the way I'm going to do it right now, but if you walk into somebody's house and say, they say, have a seat, you size that chair up even subconsciously before you sit in it, right? So let's just say that I've never been in your house. I've never sat in your chair. And so I say, well, thank you for the offer of a chair, but how do I know that chair is going to hold me up? Try not to be offended. But I'm an unbeliever, okay? How can I become a believer in that chair? Well, sit. I might hurt myself. I can observe it. It seems to have all the right parts and they seem to be connected, all right? Number two, I can test it without becoming vulnerably connected, right? Number three, I can say, well, this is your chair. Have you sat in it? And you say, yes. Did it hold you up? And you say, yes. Now I have three pieces of evidence upon which to base my faith. Observation, empirical testing, and a witness. I now have come to believe that that chair will hold me up. Isn't that good? Am I receiving any benefits from the chair yet? Why not? I believe. 
Oh, I have to trust. How do you trust a chair? Sit down. How far down do I have to sit in order to trust the chair? Have you ever tried to look like you're sitting in a chair when you aren't? You know, oh boy, this is comfortable. My knees are killing me already, right? There's no such thing as half trust, right? Either trust the chair and sit down or stand up. You'll be a lot more comfortable. So saving faith, trust that gets the job done, involves both an intellectual element. It's not a leap in the dark. It's a leap in the light. Even when I observe and test and get a witness, that doesn't mean that when I sit down in the chair this time, it's going to be the time that the heat of Arizona has finally worked the glue to where it's not holding and it all of a sudden gives way. It could be that moment. So there is a trust factor. No matter how much evidence I have, I never have proof until I sit. So commitment involves a risk but it's with your eyes wide open. Now, I believe commitment to God, trusting God, involves a threefold commitment. Number one, you have to give him your past. That would be the first half of the diagram. You've sinned. Sin is killing you. It's going to take your life. You can never unsin a sin. You can never unrun a stop sign. You can never unsay a word. You can never undo a deed. If you do it right, that's next time. The wrong's still there. My past condemns me. There's nothing I can do about it. And so I have to say, God, I'm trusting you for forgiveness. I'm confessing you've said you're faithful and just to cleanse and forgive, please. I have to simply trust that he, he's going to do what he said. And he went to a lot of work to make it possible, so that gives me reason to trust. Secondly, I have to trust him with my eternity. There's absolutely nothing I can do about the eternity. It's totally out of my grasp. And that's where Jesus says, I'm your savior. He gives us eternal life. It comes in Jesus. We trust him and we have eternal life. Um, we shall be saved by his life. He says, I give you eternal life. Thirdly, I have to trust him with my present. Now, here's where the problem comes in. We like to give God our past because it's a mess and he, 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 he takes care of it. Amen? And we like the idea of eternity. Mansions, streets of gold, you know, heaven, good things. Absolutely. Nothing I can do about that. Great. I want to trust you for eternity. I'm going to trust you with my past. And God says, now trust me with your present. And we say, now wait a minute. Don't I get to run anything? And the present is where the Bible says he's our Lord. Now what is a Lord? The person in authority. A senor, right? Spanish. The Lord is the boss. You know, they translate Lord in Spanish, senor, and you call somebody senor, but in English, try this on your boss this week. He asks you to do something, you, you say, yes, Lord. <laughs> it would be good English, but it may not be a good idea. Right? Right? But it would be true. It would be extremely respectful. The Lord lived in the castle and everybody did what the Lord said. The Lord is the boss. So Jesus is not only our forgiveness and our Savior, but he's our Lord. Now we like to give God two-thirds of our life. We like to give in the past and eternity, but we want to be in charge of the present. And God says to us, you're going to receive no more salvation from two-thirds trust than you'll receive rest from two-thirds sitting down. It's all or it's nothing. And lordship is where we have our difficulty, living life now, day by day, with Jesus. We get all messed up on that. We get discouraged. We try, and, we try the wrong things and they don't work. And we get discouraged and we give up. So let's talk about lordship from the chair. Now this is the chair of faith. So when I'm sitting in the chair, I'm trusting. When I'm trusting, am I saved? 
Yes, come on people, I've been preaching this for three weeks. When I'm trusting, am I saved? Yes, okay. So let's put a canopy over the chair here. Jesus' life and death, the diagram, think the diagram, the canopy over the chair. He lived, he died, he rose, he's done it all. Now, it's not an umbrella I hold in my hand. I can't carry it around with me. The only way to get under the canopy of salvation is be trusting sitting in the chair, okay? Now, let's put wheels on the chair. Life moves on. Let's put the Lord behind the chair. He's Lord of the chair and me when I'm in it. And one day he says, uh, Gary, let's go this direction. And I say, okay, Lord, um, I'm trusting. I'm covered. You're in charge. Let's go. Another day he points over a little bit to the left. He says, let's go this way today. And I say, I'm trusting. I'm covered. You're in charge. Let's go. One day he says, let's just wait here a while. And I look around and this is not where I want to wait. But I want to stay covered. And the only way to stay covered is to stay seated, trusting, and so by trusting, I end up waiting. Trusting leads to waiting. Waiting doesn't lead to trusting. You got that? Now, one day, God says, we're going hard to the right here, kind of symbolic. You're going to go over there to the right. And I look over there to the right, and I say, Lord, that's not my idea of where I want to go with my life. That's not my plan at all. In fact, Lord, let me tell you, over here hard to the left, that's where I want to go. That's my idea of life. That's, that's what I want to do. Now, what are my options? If I stay in the chair and keep trusting, where am I going? His way. What is my other option? My other option is not to go the other way. My other option is is to get out of the chair. You follow that? Which is to make one simple point. What is the focus of the Christian life once I come to Jesus? Is it to try hard now to be good and not be bad? Or is it to try hard to trust and keep trusting? So the chair illustration is simply made to make this one point. The focus of the Christian life once I come to Jesus is not behavior modification. The focus of the Christian life once I come to Jesus is a trust relationship. But will the trust relationship result in behavior modification? You can't help it. And it actually works, contrary to our own attempts at behavior modification. So the focus of the Christian life is to work on trust. And trust will transform behavior. Now, this is the difference between a relational theology and a behavioral theology. We naturally gravitate to a behavioral theology. I've got to stop doing the bad, start doing the good, so God will be happy with me and take me to heaven. It'll never work. But if I focus on trust, try hard to trust, not try hard to behave, the behavior will automatically happen. Does that make sense? So the focus of my life as a Christian is not to work on my behavior, it's to work on trust. How do you work on trust? Ladies, do you pick up hitchhikers? I can see. Elba driving down the road, inviting all these homeless people into her Motorhome. No. Why don't you pick up hitchhikers? You've heard stories, right? Now, you're heading home today, and I'm standing by the road with my thumb out. My tie, my shirt, it's me, Pastor Gary. Would you be more likely to stop and pick me up? Yes, why? Why? Because you know me. Because you know me. I heard a preacher about 40 years ago say, you cannot trust someone you do not know. Happened to be Morris Venden, pastor when I was in college. I remember hearing him say that. You can't trust someone you do not know. And I'm thinking, that's awfully black and white. Isn't there a more nuanced understanding? No, there isn't. You can't trust someone you don't know. Somebody said, you get on an airplane, you don't know the pilot. 
I know the training the pilot's been through. I trust the system. And I'll even trust more if I know the pilot. If he's a good pilot. You can't trust somebody you don't know. That's why we don't pick up hitchhikers. You pick up a hitchhiker, it's not trust, it's a gamble. 1977, late summer, I was up visiting my sister in Bozeman, Montana, and I wanted to go into Yellowstone National Park. Just inside the North Gate, south of Livingston, is a place called Roaring Springs where a hot river runs into a cold river, and you can kind of pick your jacuzzi eat. It's a cool spot. And I'd never been there, I'd heard about it, and I didn't have a car with me, and my sister was busy, and I stuck out my thumb, and some rancher picked me up and dropped me off in the middle of nowhere, half between living, halfway between Livingston and the entrance to the park. And I sat there for a couple of hours playing my ukulele, being a hippie for an afternoon, and occasional cars went by and zoomed on by, didn't pay any notice to me at all. I thought I was going to camp right there, until... A lady with two or three small children in a blue Chevy station wagon drove by kind of slowly, and they all looked at me as they went by. A few minutes later, they came back the other way, and they all looked at me as they went by again. A minute later, she came back again and stopped right in the road, long straight stretch, almost no traffic, perfectly safe. And she leaned over and rolled down the passenger window. Remember that when you had to lean over and roll down the window? You know, my new car is only this wide. I still have electric windows, right? I had to roll down the window. And she said, young man, nobody's going to pick you up here. I said, really? Why? And she did something actually quite foolish. I think it was a God thing, though, or I'd still be there. She said, get in, you look honest. So I, I didn't argue. I got in the car. I was going to trust her <laughs> or take a gamble on her. And as we're driving along, I said, so why do you say no one picks up, picks up hitchhikers here? She said, well, a couple of years ago, a guy in a little sports car uh, picked up a hippie right along this stretch of road, and the hippie made him pull off down by the river, and the hippie killed the driver and ate him. And when they arrested the hippie, the man's fingers were in his pocket. I think I understand why they didn't pick up hitchhikers there. The point is, we don't pick up hitchhikers because we don't know them, but if I were out hitchhiking, you'd be more likely to pick me up because you know me. You can't trust somebody you do not know. And if you get to know somebody who's trustworthy, the more you know them, the more you'll trust them. You can't help it. It's an automatic byproduct. And if you get to know somebody who's not trustworthy, the more you know them, the less you'll trust them. And we've all met some of those. But the point is, the focus of the Christian life after I come to Jesus is not on behavior, it's on trust. I work on trust, not behavior, but I can't work on trust directly. I can only work on trust indirectly, and I do that by getting to know. And the Bible says eternal life is knowing Jesus. John 17, verse 3. That's interesting, because I thought it required confession and repentance and forgiveness, and, and, and. We have our whole list of the steps to eternal life. And here Jesus says, if you know me, you're in. Well, how can that be? Because if I know him, well, I trust him. He is trustworthy. I'm, I, I witness to that. And the more you know him, the more you'll trust him. If you're having problems staying in the chair when he gives directions, you need to get to know him better. The more you know him, the more you'll trust him. You can't help it. So what's my job as a Christian once I give my life to Jesus? To work on getting to know him more and more day by day. A relationship. A relationship is not something you, you know, I, 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 I had a potato yesterday. Boom, I had the potato, right? I had a relationship yesterday. <laughs> that doesn't make as much sense, does it? Um, because a relationship is not something you had. If it's a relationship, it's something you're having, right? It's ongoing. So let's be practical. How do you get to know somebody? You see somebody across the room, the spark flies. You know, we all remember those days centuries ago, you know. And, 
and we want to get to know them all of a sudden for some strange biological reason. So what do we do? Find a way to, can I take you out to dinner? Can we go out and picnic? Can we go do something? Do you want to take them out to dinner because you're starving? No, you could have just had a good meal and you'd want to take them out to dinner, right? Can we go out somewhere? Why? Because you want to spend some time together and that time is to get acquainted. Communion, communication. You know, you could, you could spend time with somebody, spend it all watching television, you'll never get to know them. You need somewhere where you can talk, where you can commune. If you spend time in communication with somebody, will you get to know them? Yes. You can't help it. And if they're trustworthy, will you come to trust them? You can't help it. So how do we do that with God? I know this is simple, but time with God is time. If you don't have time to carve time for God, you don't have time for a relationship. And that relationship will fade and die. We have to budget time. You know that in your relationships with your spouse, your children, your family. The only way you have time for the important relationships in your life is if you schedule it. Otherwise, the busyness of life will eat it all up and your relationships will fall apart. You got to spend time with God in the same way. And you got to spend that time doing things where, that foster communication. I mean, I suggest reading your Bible, praying, listening, talking, meditating, how, whatever words you want to use. And the purpose of that Bible and prayer time is not to figure out what the mark of the beast is and what day the, to worship on and where the dead go when they die. The purpose of this time with God is to know Jesus because to know Jesus is eternal life. Not to know doctrine is eternal life, but to know Jesus is eternal life. By the way, if you get to know Jesus deeply, you'll get the right doctrine. That'll come. But I've known a lot of people who have the right doctrine who don't know Jesus and act like the devil. Right? So there's the point of the sermon today. How to survive getting saved. So you got saved. Now what do you do? Get to know Jesus. Time daily for the purpose of knowing Jesus is what the focus of the Christian life is all about. And if you know him, you'll trust him. If you trust him, you're saved. You can't help it. And he will transform your behavior as well. That's not, a, that's not an incidental that's a necessary, but it's a byproduct of what we focus on. We don't focus on trying hard to be good and not be bad. We focus on knowing him. And to know him is eternal life. Because if we know him, we'll trust him. If we trust him, we're covered with grace. If we're covered with grace, we're on the bus. And we're going to end up where the bus is going, which is eternal life. Let's pray. Jesus I think this is what church is all about, to get together on a weekly basis and remind each other what we're supposed to be doing. And that's not a list of do's and don'ts, but to remind ourselves that it's all about relationships with you and with each other as we lock arms together, walking towards the kingdom, following Jesus. We know that it is opposed by a very powerful de demonic spirit. We wrestle against supernatural powers who want to do anything to keep us from being on track. But we also know that if we seek Jesus daily, you guarantee we're going to make it. We shall be saved. You have lived, died, risen. You reign. You have the power to get us there and have us ready when we get there if we will just daily take time to sit at your feet Deepen our relationship so that our trust grows stronger and nothing can shake us out of that chair of faith. Lord, may we spend our focus on knowing you day by day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.